Well, everyone, I want to thank you for being here tonight. I'm uh, Representative Harold Naughton. I represent for the 12th Worcester District, I'm chairman of the House Committee on Public Safety and Homeland Security, but for tonight's purposes, most importantly, a proud graduate of Clinton High School, uh -huh. uh, and I won't mention the year. Um, and actually, this high school wasn't even here when I graduated. Uh, I want to welcome you all to our, our first Community Substance Abuse Awareness Program. And I say our first because I see this as a starting point. We don't have all the answers, to, even, even with this tremendous panel that sits beside me tonight and the tremendous resources that were exhibited in the cafeteria earlier. We don't have all the answers here tonight. We probably don't even have half the questions because of this epidemic that's overtaken our community and our area and really our, our country. Uh, so you to come out tonight and spend some time with us and learn about this means a lot. But this is, this is the first step in a road towards recovery and using the word recovery in a very global sense because we are all in this together. If your family hasn't been touched by this, you know a family that's been touched by this even up until this past weekend when we saw uh, someone close to, someone who's close to all of us in one of our towns lost a family member. Um, and if you want to get to brass tacks, it costs more than lives, though of course that's the most important thing. It cost us in our schools, in our courts, in our probation departments, in our police departments, in our district attorney's offices, and in our social services. So it's incumbent upon all of us, just as fellow citizens, to come together to try to defeat this scourge, because it touches all of us in one way or another. I want to truly thank our partners here tonight, besides our panelists who will be introducing themselves very shortly, uh, Clinton High School. And we've got tremendous support uh, from our great superintendent, uh, Terry Ngano uh, of the Clinton Schools, and Jim Hastings, the principal here at Clinton High School, uh, from our tremendous Clinton Police Department, uh, Chief Leviger, and, uh, and, and here on the panel, Lieutenant Brian Coyne, who have been at the tip of the spear fighting this scourge, and our, our own Clinton item, I still call it the Clinton item, uh, that has helped us tremendously making people aware of this. Uh, they and so many other partners that are listed in the program this evening, I want to thank for the effort that's been put here tonight. Uh, we have some great friends, uh, in addition uh, to those mentioned. Uh, Jim LeBlanc from the Clinton Board of Selectmen, uh, and congratulations to the newly elected Mark Grasso from the Lancaster Board of Selectmen. And uh, Tina, are you still on the school committee? Tina Zapantis from the Clinton School Committee. I, I, should, I, I shouldn't have to ask that question. She does tremendous work there. Um, and if we have other of our uh, elected officials and public servants who come in over the course of the evening, uh, we will mention them. I'm happy that uh, Chief Galvin from the town of Berlin is here. And, uh, and of course, uh, Father Nally is here with us uh, from St. John's. And uh, so I don't get in trouble. I told him we won't open it with a prayer, but I know he'll be sitting there saying a prayer for us that we're successful tonight and that we overcome this. He's a dear friend. He was sending me notes when I was deployed last year. That meant a lot to me. Um, this event would not have been possible without of all, all of those people. Uh, many of us here have felt the tragic impact of abuse and substance abuse on our families, our, the community. And we've seen an increase in this in related deaths. In 2015, and this is, these are the uh, figures that we were given, but perhaps people on the committee, on the uh, panel, will have uh, more specifics. We estimate that 1,500 people lost their lives in Massachusetts due to opioid overdoses. This pattern can't continue. Uh, you see it in all stratos of society. It's colorblind. It doesn't, uh, have a, it, it doesn't discriminate for race or orientation. Uh, wealth status, it hits all of us. You're going to hear from people who are on the ground confronting this problem every day. Uh, I hope in listening to them, we all become better equipped to understand this problem and know what is being done. Our panel will work as follows. Uh, I'm going to let each of our panelists, and I'll start to my left, uh, to your right, introduce themselves and tell us what their involvement in this issue has been. And I'm asking them to take two minutes or so to tell us about that. <clears throat> After that, uh, we have already collected some questions from the audience, uh, and my staff 
uh, is uh, walking around with note cards. Uh, we ask that if you have a question, you write it on a note card and submit it. And we're here till about 8 o'clock, so we will ask as many questions as we can in that period of time. Uh, I ask that um, we not get too, too specific uh, to you know, maybe a family problem or something uh, other than if, I ask that you keep your questions that might be able to derive answers that uh, answer uh, a broader a broader spectrum. But, but we have got Susan Templeton uh, walking down the aisle here. Uh, we have got Noah Futterman over there. I know Jim Keedy, tall Jim, is, is around someplace. And of course, uh, Clinton, Burdett Hill's own, and even though she grew up in Sterling, I still say she's in Burdett Hill. Megan Kilcoyne is up here uh, with me uh, to, uh, to pass me the questions. Uh, so that being said, um, what I'd like to do is start uh, here with uh, our own district attorney, tremendously busy, came with a great group of his staff tonight, and District Attorney Joe Worley, if, uh, thank you for coming, and if you could describe your office's involvement with this issue. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, our office involvement it, it is on many levels. Basically, we've got an office that sees every unattended death in the county. So far, we've got about 32 this year, two over the weekend, one in the city, one in the suburbs. We've been in triple figures the last three years. So we've done a bunch of things with regards to this. Number one rule is showing compassion, staying within the law. And when I got elected 10 years ago, one of the big things, uh, for me, it's prevention. It's prevention. Uh, and I think there's a couple things we got to do with regards to the problem. You know, I can talk about four things right off the bat. I'm going to be brief. Better prescribing practices. You, you know, uh, when these drugs started coming out, the pharmaceutical companies told us they were non-addictive. Oxycontin was non-addictive. Uh, the American Medical Association lobbied with the FDA to get it so that they did not have to take pain management or prescribing techniques for the doctors, which is crazy. UMass is the first in the, in the area, maybe first in the country, is going to be doing with their med school in the future. I think we've got to use more Narcan, better and easier access to Narcan. Seeing it work in person, it's a life-saving drug. We've got to remove the stigma. Instead of using words like crackhead, junkie, addict, we've got to start using the words for what they are. Son, daughter, brother, sister. And by re removing the stigma, we're going to get better access and treatment. We're going to get better people seeking treatment. You know, we, we had 45,000 deaths on the roads in 2014. When you have a car accident, what do you see? Sometimes a helicopter in the air. It's the lead story in the news. We've got to bring those resources to, to the problem. When you see an accident, we don't stand for it. We call for science, say for roads, say for cars. We've got to do that with regards to this. And just to finalize, we also have seeking grants. We've got a pilot program right now up in Fitchburg. Allows us to do something that most people would think is common sense. When someone comes in on an overdose, we get the family. We have them do an intervention with the person. AdCare's on call 24-7. We use AdCare, we use Spectrum. AdCare's on call 24-7. They're going to be coming in and say, hey, we got a bed for you. we got money for 72 long-term beds. Think about it. If you had a heart attack, you went to the hospital, they wouldn't tell you to come back in three weeks if you're still alive. And we shouldn't be doing with that addict, with our, with our people who are addicted. The last thing we recently applied, and I want to thank the senator and the rep for the help that they gave us getting that grant. Also, we got the Hal Rogers grant, two-year grant, about $400,000, which is going to allow us to get data, not just, so we just don't have anecdotal evidence, but real-time, real facts that help us fight the problem. We've got money for NACAN. We're going to be doing 911 billboards, Samaritan type billboards. We're going to be getting into the schools. We, we've got showings of the movie, If Only, in the Hungry Heart. We're bringing out to the schools, and we hope to be bringing here to Clinton as well. That's basically what our office is doing on the problem. Thank you. Thank you, District Attorney Early. Um, to a, a couple other people, uh, we've got uh, Russell Pondres from uh, our dear friend, Congresswoman Nikki Songas' office here with us right here. Uh, the Congresswoman is <coughs> deeply involved in this issue, and uh, she's in Washington right now but she wanted to be represented here. We thank her. And I, and I have to thank a personal friend of mine who put this idea into my head at breakfast at the Bridge Diner a couple months ago, and that's uh, Bill McGrail uh, from the uh, Clinton Hospital Board. And uh, hey, I, I can't talk to you now, Mr. Speaker. I'll call you later. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, and, uh, so as we, and Lynn Ryan from uh, Berlin, who's on the Acibet uh, School Committee. Another member of my staff up back, if you have a question, Skip Bacot, you know, with the red tie standing against the wall, a very distinguished gentleman. And speaking of distinguished uh, person, I've had a privilege to serve in the House with for many years now, 
who was a true statewide, and I, I would suggest national leader on this issue, uh, but my dear friend, uh, she came all the way out uh, from Mattapan and uh, Mission Hill and the city of Boston, all those places. I told you, welcome to Dorchester with trees. Uh, Representative Liz Malia, uh, House Chair of the Committee on Mental Health and Substance Abuse, who's been a true, true leader on this issue, and, and will this evening also talk about some recent legislation that we, uh, we did. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Representative Naughton, it's an honor and a privilege to be here, but it's also a real um, privilege to work with you and um, as someone who has been a former member of the Public Safety Committee and aware of a lot of the work that, that you do, I'm, I'm, I'm particularly impressed in terms of the impact um, that you're having. Um, but I also want to say, just as someone who is a, a, a citizen, who is someone who has uh, been involved in the political world for a long time, um, but also who spends a lot of time in my district. Um, I serve a pretty in intense inner city area of Boston, parts of Jamaica Plain, Roxbury, uh, Rosendale, and Dorchester. And one of the viewpoints I've had of watching some of the opioid epidemic um, spread and, and, and take over has been, you know, historically knowing 10, 15, 20 years ago, there was there were uh, there were a lot of concerns about drug dealing and violence that was associated with that that was impacting some of our communities, especially some of our young people. And we responded to that on the on the city and on the state level. Um, we had new drug enforcement laws. We had more um, more um, strict you know, man mandatory minimum sentences. We put a lot more people in jail over 10, 15, 20 years. Um, what I think we've learned is that, A, that didn't stop the epidemic that we see, ourse see ourselves in right now, that we find ourselves in right now. And B, we spent a lot of money on something that didn't have very good results. And we all might have had um, the best of intentions, but we didn't really understand what was behind addiction. Um, I myself as someone who's in recovery for, for about 30, 35 years. Um, and, you know, alcohol, addiction to alcohol is a very, still a very, very serious issue. Something that I came th th up through my, one of my predecessors in the legislature, Ke Kevin Fitzgerald, who, who was one of the first people who really started talking about, um, Great we have to talk about what it means to be an addict. It's not a moral issue. It's not, um, it's not a judgment thing. It's not something that we, we label people with. It's a disease, and it has to be dealt with that way. And um, I think when we've had some significant victories over the last two or three years in terms of changing state policy, we're really moving in the right direction. We've done that. We've been able to put a lot more dollars into, into addressing the substance use crisis that we have but we have a long way to go. We have to figure out um, what, it, what it takes to get people who have substance use disorders into treatment. And the most recent legislation that we passed, um, among other things, requires an individual who suffers from an apparent overdose brought into the emergency room. They're given a substance abuse evaluation before they're discharged, and we attempt to connect them with services. Um, we put limits on first-time pers prescribers, um, and we've made some technical changes. We've put more money in. Um, the one thing that I'm very, very thankful for, and I think um, my co-chair here on the uh, Mental Health and Substance Abuse Committee has done an amazing amount of work on, which, which was getting women with substance use di disorder um, into appropriate facilities instead of in, into Framingham. Um, we have a lot to do. I'm very glad to be here, and it really is a relief and a pleasure to be out of the city. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can everybody hear us up in the back? We good? Good. Excellent. Thank you. You know, we're very lucky in our area uh, with our uh, uh, legislators and among them our, uh, our, our own who represents the town of Clinton as part of her district, but also the Senate chair of the Committee on uh, Mental Health and Substance Abuse, our own uh, Senator Jennifer Flanagan. Welcome, Senator. Thank you, Representative, and thank you all for being here today. You know, as the, as the co-chair of the Mental Health and Substance Abuse Committee, I can tell you that I have no better partner in this fight than Representative Malia. And 
And I can tell you that um, it's very beneficial to have a look from the inner city perspective and then from out here west of 495. So, you know, while I get a lot of accolades out here in the district, my co-chair, who's sort of silent in, in all that press, really is a driving piece of this. And I can tell you that the most recent conference committee we sat on for the legislation she spoke about earlier was tough. I mean, it was tough negotiations. And I think everyone's heart was in the right place. It's just trying to figure out how to get there at the same time. So I appreciate the representative for, be for being here. Um, you know, one of the things I really want to make clear, and I really want to make clear to, to, to people who might not even be here, the steps that we're taking in the fight against addiction is not going to prevent people who live with chronic illness from receiving the medications that they need. We are in no way, shape, or form trying to prevent someone who lives with a debilitating disease from getting their medications, which can include and does include oxy. Um, a lot of times we hear from people saying, you know, you're forgotten about us, I live with fibromyalgia, or I live with cancer, mm. or I have, uh, you know, whatever medical disease that you have. This is not an attempt to do that at all. And I just want to make that clear because there's oftentimes people think we're trying to do that. But with the legislation that we just passed in the, in the House and the Senate, there's also some other provisions. This was really a bill on treatment, prevention, and intervention. Um, if you remember last year, the gov uh, Governor Patrick signed into, bill, signed into law the access to treatment bill. That required insurance companies to cover detox and po post-detox up to 14 days. That was our access to treatment bill. So what the legislature had decided with the, uh, the lead of Representative Mallier and I was to go after treatment, education, and prevention. And some of that you heard from the DA. And I think that's really good indication of the fact that all of us up here have a part to play. And we have our own roles to play. One of the most controversial pieces um, that you might have heard about was the SBIRT. That was the verbal screening that we're going to have done in the high schools and middle schools across Massachusetts. It stands for screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment. Essentially, it's a 10-minute conversation with a student. And through a, through a host of very specific questions, the person who is, whether it's a therapist, whether it's the nurse, whether it's a, a guidance counselor, they'll be able to identify the risky behaviors of teenagers to the point that 80 to 85% of these kids screen out. They don't have any abnormal risky behaviors. They don't have anything that you really have to be concerned about. But there's a certain portion, um, and there were 10 schools doing this in Massachusetts already, who have found it to be very, very successful. These, these kids are looking to talk to somebody. There's a very small portion of people that have actually had to be referred to treatment. And the one thing that if you ever go into one of our, if you ever talk to people in prison or people in jail, they'll tell you they usually start around their teenage years. Mm -hmm. So the question we had is why not start talking to kids and, and assessing their risky behaviors while they're teenagers? And so what, what I had hoped was we were going to do 7th and 10th grade, but DPH is going to have um, the authority to change the, the grades and really just have a conversation. This is in no way a drug test, a urine test, a blood test. We are not intervening in those types of things. It's merely a conversation that the parents can opt the child out of, the child can opt out of before um, they're given the question, and at any point in time, it can be stopped. So, that was just one of the major pieces of it, and I will be brief, but there was a, there's a couple others. People are going to have the ability to voluntarily opt out of opiate treatment. We all have a medical record. We can all tell our doctors that we're allergic to whatever we're allergic to so that there's a red flag and we never get, you know, amoxicillin or antibiotics or what have you. You'll be able to tell your doctor you don't want opiates so that when the time comes, there's no question about it. That's something that you can do with your physician and that that will go into your record because we're requiring doctors to look at the prescription monitoring program every time they go to prescribe an opiate. And that will come up as a red flag in your, in your directive. Um, so for any non-emergency type <coughs> procedure, you'll be able to opt out of the opiates. Um, I'm sure there'll be questions. There's a whole host of things we do in this legislation, but um, we really appreciate the opportunity to explain what the legislature's been trying to do. Thank you, Senator. Thank you for your leadership on this. Uh, you know, in the town of Clinton, it's always been very important to us. We've had a courthouse here, and uh, it, uh, it helps a lot of people. It's, 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 it's always been very important to us, and, and not just me as a practicing attorney, but it's like an institution in the town. We're lucky that uh, we're represented, uh, they're represented here today by our probation service and our own Pat Ball, the probation chief here at the uh, Clinton District Court. And up here with us is a, uh, 
a great asset who works at the Probation Training Center here in Clinton, uh, Diane Richard, who's the lead program manager from the Mass Probation Service. Uh, Diane, thank you for being here with us tonight. Thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you all of you for being here tonight. And um, before I start a little explanation about where I come from, I want to say thank you to the children that are watching and the young adults that are watching here today. Um, if I could offer any advice in my 23 years of dealing with people in addiction, it is to just say no, have the courage to say no. Um, when somebody asks you, and also have the courage to help a friend that might not have had that same courage as you had to say no. So um, probation started in 1841 in Massachusetts. That's something that we're very proud of here. Our training academy is in Clinton, thanks to Representative Naughton. Um, all our probation officers get trained out of that academy. I am the lead program manager in our audience today. We have the statewide supervisor, Patty Gavin, who is also from Clinton. Um, I consider myself an honorary Clintonian that, now that I've worked here for 10 years, and I mean that by no offense, as I understand that you have to be born here to be one of them. But I do, I do, I do hold you that in is, my heart. That is a uh, rare, <laughs> rare honor, as everyone will tell you. So just, just so you know, um, the I think Gordon Langton's the only other one that's got uh, <laughs> that, that honor. Well, I thank you. I, I, I accept it graciously and humbly. Thank you for that. Um, but as a probation service, as I served as a probation officer for about 10 years and now in the capacity of a lead program manager at the training academy. All of our training, all of our substance abuse training goes through the, all of our, uh, our academy and regionally. We have a lot of education around this topic because unfortunately it's our business. But fortunately for us it is our business because we have the most highly educated, dedicated people who are going to take our people and our, our residents and our children in their hands and, and guide them to what research shows is most effective in dealing with people that have um, substance use issues or, or the disorder. We do use the, the brain disease model. We have been for many years. There is no stigma attached from where we come from. It's just helping hands. And um, again, thank you for all for being here today, for having enough desire to make a difference, to sit here and, and educate yourself and hopefully educate other people on this epidemic. Thank you. Diane, thank you. You know, another great institution in our town that uh, we've worked, many of us, many people have worked very hard to keep here when many small hospitals have closed is the Clinton Hospital. And we're lucky to have Dr. Brian Cheshire uh, with us uh, tonight. And he is the medical director of the Clinton Hospital ER. And I'm sure he could have this panel entirely to himself for the rest of the night to talk about what they see in the ER. So, Doctor, welcome. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and um, thank you for this wonderful panel. Uh, such a diverse group, um, especially our political leaders, Senator Representative Naughton, for putting this together. Bringing this huge problem to the forefront, <clears throat> not only politically, but providing the tools that we need to uh, uh, to solve this huge problem. Um, the police officers, the paramedics, the social workers are kind of the spear, the head of the spear, as was mentioned earlier. I guess the emergency departments can be thought of as, as the mass unit or the battalion hospital. Um, for the people who just have very serious immediate problems, they end up in our emergency departments. Um, we, we, we fix the physical problems, understanding that Underneath this physical problem is a very difficult social, um, psyche, psychological, and addictive problem. Um, only if we can work together and in a coordinated effort, it's not just medicines, it's not just stabilizing the acute medical care. It's hooking these people up with the counseling they need. It's continuity of care. It's providing beds for people that desperately need the rehab, providing resources for counselors, educating the kids to know that, you know, it's not only okay to say no, but it's okay to ask for help. Um, and let me assure you, um, I, I'm not from around here, as most people will <laughs> They know, trust so, me. Yeah, they so, know. Um, <laughs> I was born and raised in the southeast, and uh, I've worked at hospitals in my 27-year-plus career, all up and down the eastern seaboard, including small rural towns in Alabama, including medical centers, including the wonderful hospital we have here at Clinton. Um, and let me tell you, overdose is the same whether it's in Clinton mm -hmm. Hospital, Emergency Department, or whether it's at Boston Medical Center, Mass General. The medical, physical part of this is the same. That's easy. That's the easy part. 
But let me also assure you that here in Clinton, a nice community, very nice, hardworking people that we see and take care of every day, don't kid yourself. Drug abuse, heroin abuse, overdoses, deaths, very serious physical problems are here in your community. Um, the more that the community knows this, the more that the community can be proactive in helping us, giving us the tools that we need to combat this, is really the only way that we're going to be successful. And I appreciate you having me here on that. Doctor, we appreciate you being here. We know we have a crazy busy schedule. Uh, and just to show what a broad-based issue this is, it isn't just local and our state officials, it, this is national and we've got, we're very lucky to have with us uh, from the federal government, um, the public information officer from the Boston office of the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Administration, Special Agent Timothy Desmond. Special Agent Desmond. Thank you. Good evening. On behalf of the Drug Enforcement Administration, I'd like to thank Representative Naughton, the Clinton Police Department, in the item for the invitation to participate in this important discussion. It's no secret that New England and most of the nation has a significant heroin prescription pain medication problem. Before the day ends, Massachusetts will lose four of its citizens to an opioid overdose. We are in real danger of losing a generation to this insidious disease. Heroin and prescription painkillers do not discriminate. It affects folks from all walks of life. It is not limited to a certain demographic or geographic area. Today, approximately 80% of new heroin addicts report they first abused prescription pain medication, mm -hmm. then switch to heroin. DEA, while working with its federal, state, and local partners, are targeting heroin distribution cells, which have become an increasing threat to the safety and security of our communities. DEA works to disrupt and dismantle violent drug trafficking organizations, as well as homegrown traffickers in Massachusetts that obtain heroin and fentanyl from other states for local distribution. DEA stresses the importance of working at the street level to prevent violent drug-related crime, while at the same time pursuing an investigation <coughs> to the highest level of cartel leadership. Law enforcement is not the sole answer, and that prevention, treatment, education, and awareness are all critical to our success. Opiate addiction is a disease, and that law enforcement, along with educators and treatment professionals, need to coordinate efforts to combat this problem. <coughs> Again, thank you. For Special having. Agent Desmond. My name is Elizabeth Haddad and I work for District Attorney Joseph D. Early Jr. here in Worcester County. And our display that we have here is called Hidden in Plain Sight. Uh, it's a display that shows parents somewhat of a typical bedroom and some of the places where kids might be hiding drugs or drug paraphernalia. Some things are common household items like a tissue box where kids could put things inside like a lighter or something else like that. Other things are things that people could order off the internet, like a false bottom water bottle, or even something like this, like deodorant. It actually looks real. It's got actual deodorant in it, but the bottom comes off. Drugs can be hidden in there. And then, of course, there's other household items, like uh, mint containers. Uh, you might find things like lighters, foil, spoons, anything like that might be a tip off that there's some drug on Thank you. Um, and <coughs> finally, turning over to this side of the table, our, our very own, um, we're very proud of, uh, our, our own Clintonian who's risen through the ranks of the uh, Clinton Police Department and has taken this issue on uh, head on, uh, Detective uh, Lieutenant uh, Brian Coyne of the Clinton Police Department. Thank you, Representative Naughton. Back. Can you guys hear me in the back? Yeah. I'll move this a little bit. Sorry about that. I'd also like to thank Chief Levenger and all the members of the Clinton Police Department for allowing me to represent you and, and have a voice here on the panel. Thank the other panelists and especially thank everybody out here in the audience here tonight. Um, this is something that I've been talking about for a long time since I've become lieutenant over the last couple of years. And I'm glad Representative Naughton and the Clinton Police Department had a hand in it and the item putting this all together. Um, this is a very important issue for the town of Clinton. 
Uh, many communities in the United States, and especially in New England and Massachusetts, are struggling with the issues related to drug dependency. Like the doctor said, Clinton is no different than any other community. We've seen an upsurge in the use of uh, especially opiates and prescription drugs. We've seen our share, way too many. Uh, overdoses, fatal and non-fatal overdoses, way too many in our community. And we want to do something about that. We understand that the, the police role is changing. And um, the police, along with the fire department and any other emergency first responders, are the front lines of this problem. We were the first lines of uh, any consequences of drug abuse every day. We see it. That the heroin issue, like most social problems, inevitably ends up at the door of the police because unlike many other organizations, the police department must answer the phone and respond to emergencies 24-7, 365 days out of the year. We understand the problem. And some of the changes that, that we've seen over the years that I've seen as a police officer in the last 19 years, it, it's really historic right now what we're seeing. We're now hearing police officials from across the country saying that heroin is a medical problem. It's not the way we viewed the heroin issue or drug issue over the last 40 years. Uh, historically, the police and law enforcement have generally viewed drug use and addiction as a criminal justice and police issue. But and we put a lot of people in jail over the years, and some of that has hurt community relations. But I think the police are starting to understand and starting to view it, and we're starting to respond to it differently. We're now recognizing that it is a medical issue as well as a police matter. And we also recognize, like the representative from Mattapan said, it, we know that we cannot arrest our way out of the problem. But we also know that arrests are still a very important part of the solution, as they often provide pressure that makes all of the other elements of our responses to the heroin epidemic more effective. Police working with the DA's office, we have a great DA, ADA here, uh, district attorney. We have uh, Mike Davis here in the office locally who's handling the problems. He works with our detectives. We have Pat Ball, chief probation officer in the probation office who our department works well with. And we're trying to, um, trying to respond to this epidemic as best we can. We know our role is changing and we're viewing it differently and we're approaching it differently. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant. It's great. Uh, we're joined by uh, person I've known well for many, many years, held many uh, senior uh, positions, did a great job uh, within uh, staff at the House of Representatives and has moved over uh, to the Department of Public Health and is now the Director of Policy, Jen Burrell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think what you've seen or heard so far is that we're a diverse panel, which means that we can't tackle this issue. It's not just a public health, it's not just a law, law enforcement. And part of my role within the Department of Public Health is to really work across state agencies with municipalities to not only educate about the resources that DPH has, but also to hear from constituents about where the gaps are. What do you need? Um, families, law enforcement, you're the ones who are on the day-to-day -day really dealing with this issue. And where we can be helpful is hearing from you all. Um, I think my, my biggest, if you could take away today, is to really use DPH as a resource. Um, we don't always have the tools, but we can help you find the tools. Um, I have a tool sitting right next to me. Uh, I call a truck frequently <laughs> when I need help. Um, and it's really, it's going to take all of us. We are, the administration is focusing on prevention, intervention, treatment, and recovery. And it will take all of you in the audience, all of us at the pan on the panel, uh, our community on the ground level, really to try to turn the tide of this crisis. Thank you, Jen. Uh, and next, no stranger to Donna Clinton. Uh, he actually married into the town, so he married up. Uh, <laughs> Chuck Ferris, uh, the president of uh, Spectrum uh, and, uh, Healthcare. And uh, Chuck has been there for many, many years. He's uh, retiring soon, and we're going to miss him. But thankfully, we got him one last time out here, our dear friend Chuck Ferris. Thank you, Hank. Um, I, I appreciate a lot of the comments that have been um, stated here tonight, and I just want to kind of summarize a bit that, you know, if Spectrum is the 
the largest, the most diverse treatment organization in the state. We operate as far out as Pittsfield and North Adams, uh, throughout Central Mass, and up on the North Shore, all the way down to the South Shore. We've got uh, 240 beds um, in Westboro at four different levels of care. We have another 60 down in Weymouth. And we also operate all of the services for the Department of Corrections in all the state prisons throughout the state. And we also operate, operate in five other states across the country all the way out as far as Washington. We're very fortunate in this state um, because we can observe, myself and my staff have observed what we see going on in other states, that there is more being done here in Massachusetts, especially over the last 14 or 15 months than we've seen done in a long time. We're very fortunate that we've got leadership from the administration to the Attorney General to the legislature that has really stepped up and addressed this problem. I've been at this for 45 years, and I have to say unequivocally, this is the worst that I've ever seen it. Epidemic is a good word for it because it fits the, the disease model of what this really is. For a long time, and I think there's been a, a addressing this as um, the police have said that it's a law enforcement problem, that there's some type of a moral shortcoming on people's part because they use drugs or they drink too much. Um, it is not. It is a disease no any, not different than diabetes or heart disease or any other chronic disease. It has a very high relapse level. I was giving an interview several months ago and a reporter said to me, has anything good come out of this? epidemic. And I say, yeah, actually, there really has something good's come out of this. We've got people talking about it. I think a half a dozen years ago, if we had add, put on a forum like this and asked people to come and hear about it, I don't think there would have been this many people in the room. And over the last several months, or two, myself and my staff, we've probably attended a dozen of these um, throughout the state. People are recognizing this is a problem. It has no boundaries. It doesn't take time off. It doesn't discriminate and it's affecting families at every level. Over the last 10 years, we've really seen the profile of the people coming into our treatment programs has been, has been changing a great deal. Um, we're really kind of focused on the 18 to 26 year old group right now. They're more suburban, they're more educated, they're more middle, upper middle class. And these are people that have never been, they've always been touched by addiction in those areas, but not at the levels we're seeing right now. There's been a, a, a great step taken forward a, a few couple of months ago when the uh, passage of the opiate bill that the governor and the legislature put through um, that's gonna start addressing getting some of these pain medications limited in terms of their use. People that need them should get them but they're limiting them in terms of the use. And just to give you some idea of how widely spread these have been used, that I think it was last year there were 240 million prescriptions in this country written for pain medication. That's almost one prescription for every man, woman, and child in this country. The United States represents 5% of the world's population. We use 80% of the world's opiates. And now that's a pretty stunning uh, figure when you stop and think about it. And when we see the ages going down, it's not really going up. Um, it really is, sends an alert out to people, and I think that's what's get everybody's attention. It's not a disease of blame. It's not a disease of shame. People have to stop up and recognize this, and like any other disease, it has to do with early detection. Ignoring it or saying, well, it's only pot, you know, That'll make it go away. Please don't do that. And before I close my remarks, I do have to interject something about pot and say something about marijuana. I think that many of you know there's probably going to be a ballot question this November to address the recreational use of marijuana. If you take one thing away from what you're hearing here tonight, that it would please look long and hard of whether you make the decision to vote for the recreational use of marijuana. Regardless of how you feel about the issue, whether you're a pro or con, I think we should really recognize what we're getting into when the state, uh, uh, if the state should adopt um, recreational marijuana. 
We're going to open up a whole can of worms over and above what we're already facing with the opiate epidemic in this country. We don't need that now. We don't need it at any time. So please think long and hard about that. Great comments, Chuck. I couldn't agree more. Um, we're joined by a, a special individual here tonight who might be the bravest person on this panel to come out and speak openly um, as he has uh, Alex Whitney from Lancaster who uh, faced addiction uh, throughout numerous years of his life and, and, and has beat it as much as you beat it. It's an ongoing thing, I know, uh, but we're very, very happy. Now he works in addiction recovery with other people. Very happy to have Alex Whitney with us. Alex. Thank you very much. Um, this is an amazing opportunity to come down here and do this. I'm very grateful for it. Um, I grew up in Lancaster. I'm 28 years old, and I've been sober in recovery <coughs> since July 22nd, 2013. And like everybody here has touched on, uh, to me, this is a disease. Um, it wasn't as easy as just recognizing my consequences, my actions, and stopping. Um, it's progressive. It continued to get worse no matter what I tried to do. Um, and it took a long time for me to figure out that I had to ask for help. And that's one of the biggest things I can say. Um, I always thought that I could control my life, control my problems, deal with everything on my own. And it turned out that I was absolutely wrong. And it wasn't until I was you know, beaten down so much and I was so miserable and hopeless that I was able to reach out that I finally put myself in a situation where I was able to take suggestions and uh, change my life around. And it's turned into something I never thought possible. Uh, when I was actively using, I really didn't think I could live a life sober and be happy and content. And that's exactly what I have today, um, contentness, happiness every single day. Um, do I deal with issues and problems that arise? Yes, um, but the difference is I face them today. I don't run away from them and try to suppress them you know, through my drugs and alcohol use. Um, it's really, really cool to see all these people come out and, you know, share about their experience dealing with this, um, you know, your guys' willingness to listen to us. And, uh, you know, I, I've seen, I, I moved up to Portland, Maine to get sober. Um, there's a very large recovery community up there. And I've seen so many people um, come in and out of this. Uh, it is a tough thing to get. It's a tough thing to fully surrender and to basically just stop making choices for yourself for a while and just take the suggestions of everybody else. And that's what I had to do. Um, you know, it knocks down your pride, it knocks down your ego, but ultimately, you know, if you're a drug addict or an alcoholic, that's, that's something that you have to do in order to get better. And that's something that I did and that I continue to do because I know if I stop, um, I'll start going backwards and ultimately that could lead me back to a relapse. Thank you. Alex, thank you. I, I don't know. We just joined by our town administrator, Michael Ward. Michael, thank you for being here. It shows how, what interest we have in this community. Uh, I don't know if she's happy or not that we saved her last, but no discussion of this issue would be complete without a representative from the pharmaceutical industry. And we're uh, very, very pleased to have with us Marissa Watkins, who's Director of State Advocacy for Pharma, which is the trade group for uh, the pharmaceutical manufacturing and research industry. Marissa, thank you for being here with us tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you, Representative Naughton. Thank you, Alex, for sharing your story and the other panelists. Um, our members are deeply committed to working on this very serious issue. Uh, specifically here in Massachusetts, you might have seen our booth uh, in the uh, cafe. We've recently launched the Mile Beds campaign in uh, partnership with the governor and law enforcement. It is an education campaign which seeks to inform people about adherence to their medicines so that hopefully there's less left over, secure storage so that it's unavailable for misuse and abuse, and about disposal as soon as it is no longer needed. Um, in addition to those resources, there's a video that walks through in-home disposal. Um, we can get you some more information. If you visit the website, myoldmeds.com. Um, there's also a state resources section, which has um, a tool for you to search for kiosk returns if you want to return your medicine to a sheriff's location. Uh, it also has um, recovery information for you. And we just view this as another tool for the state to use in combating this very serious issue. Marissa, thank you very much. Uh, we'll now turn to our question and answer period. And Alex, I'd like to start with you. Um, in the audience, I see numerous parents and people who work with youth, people who work in our education. First hand, because you're among the younger people on the panel, uh, 
what should, except for Lieutenant Coyne, I know, that, uh, <laughs> a, boy, a boy genius here. Um, what, what should parents be looking for here? And I know we had, uh, one of the agencies had uh, Doritos cans and various things to look at, but what, what should parents, what signs should parents be looking for? Uh, I mean, I think the obvious thing is, you know, paraphernalia. But, you know, for me, when I was younger, I started using drugs and alcohol around the age of 12, and you know, I immediately knew what the consequences were, you know, that my parents were going to get very upset and things are going to happen. So I tried to hide it. And what that looks like at that age is not so much isolation, but, you know, I'm away from my family more. I'm staying out later and that kind of stuff. And I'm not necessarily saying that's always going to mean that your child is using drugs or alcohol. But for me, that's what it looked like. Um, you know, going off with friends, spending nights out, not telling my parents where I was going, um, trying to cover up my tracks. Uh, ultimately, you know, I get caught, but that's kind of what it looked like for me. Um, I knew what was coming if I got caught, so I just tried to distance myself as much as possible. We have a question from uh, uh, Jim LeBlanc, and I, and I think it's very prescient, and I'll ask, I'll direct it towards um, I guess I'll start directing it towards Marissa, but anybody else who could chime in, and I don't know if the legislation, if, if, if how effective, what specifically we did in the legislation, but there's a question about internet, internet purchases of pharmaceuticals, and you know, what, what's the security measures there? What should people be looking for there? What do we need to do? And I actually, our friend from the DEA may be able to, uh, Special Agent Desmond, uh, what, what do we need to be concerned about there? Our people, our kids being able to order this over, over the, these opioids over the internet and just getting them without their parents having knowledge of it? Or? Uh, I think we definitely agree with you. I know the DA does a lot of uh, work, hard work on this. I think you obviously have to be very careful when purchasing anything over the internet. It you know, might not be exactly what it says it is. And I think you know, along the lines of what Alex was saying, a good discussion between parents and kids about what they're doing and activity is helpful in that matter. But I know you know, our company's caution against purchasing drugs off the internet. And, okay. and you know, Lieutenant Coyne, uh, when we started this discussion um, with Bill McGrail and I several months ago, one of them was about the phishing that, that teens and the people, uh, young people do in their parents' medicine cabinets. What steps have we taken? I know in front of the Clinton Police Department, and, uh, and Chief Galvin, please feel free to, to jump in. There's a, 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 a painted up mailbox where families can drop off their, their excess uh, uh, pharmaceuticals. And can you, can you describe that and how, we need, how and if we need to expand that? Yes, that's a, that's a huge problem and concern. And a lot of people that get addicted to opiates get addicted through prescription medication. And parents need to be aware that prescription, don't save it for a rainy day, don't have a minor procedure and have a half bottle or an almost full bottle of especially a narcotic substance, an opiate, and leave it in your medicine cabinet thinking you may need it at another time. That's how a lot of kids are starting to use, use these drugs. They're taking them from their parents' medicine cabinet. And one of the things we have done, we do have a uh, drop box for any type of prescription medication. We don't take needles, but I do believe that they can be brought up to Clinton Hospital. But any type of prescription medication, after you're done using it, as prescribed by the doctor, please bring it down, drop it off. We have a procedure where we collect the medication, we bring it to, for disposal to be destroyed. That's something definitely parents should be aware of. If they have any prescription medication in their house, if it's not being used by them, even when it is being used, please secure it. Keep it away from children, keep it away from teens. And if you're not using it, if you're done using it, get rid of it in the, in the proper way and you can come down to the police station and at the kiosk right in front and drop it off. You know, I, I jumped away from the internet pharmaceutical question uh, too quickly. I didn't give uh, Special Agent Desmond his no, opportunity to answer yeah, on uh, being able to order these things over the internet. If I could follow up on what the, the Clinton PD officer was saying, that this past uh, Saturday, uh, May, uh, April 30th, was National Prescription Drug Take Back Day. And throughout four hours, I had 551 collection sites throughout um, New England. Uh, there was approximately 86,900 pounds of expired, unused, and unwanted prescription drugs. 25,000 pounds of them were uh, taken, collected in Massachusetts alone. Um, that's in comparison to in in the first one that we had on September 2010. The New England Field Division, all six states collected 25,000 pounds. Just, that's how much it's grown. Yeah. 
path since then. It's amazing. Mm -mm. The next question I'm going to pose to our two legislators and to our representative for the Department of Public Health is the agency that's going to have to implement the legislation that uh, the House and Senate passed earlier this year. But uh, Chairwoman Malia and uh, Senator Flanagan, uh, <coughs> what are our next steps? The, the legislation we passed, I think, it was a tremendous foundation. It took a lot of work on your behalf to get there. But, but what are our next, next steps from that? What, what, how can we most effectively use the tools that we've given ourselves in that legislation, and what should we be looking to do next? And then, Jen, I'd ask you to jump in for, at the end of that as well. Well, I think, um, I think from the perspective that we have is, first, we have to let this, let this work. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to take time. One of, the, one of the biggest concerns that I hear from, from my constituents and from people around the, the state and actually around the country um, when I talk to people in other states is, you've got to fix it now. Well, we didn't get here in five minutes. We're not getting out of this that quickly. We need to start to, to use all of the tools we had. Um, and I think that's why parents paying attention to what the kids are doing. Um, they're not drinking in your basements. They're having pill parties. They're, they're having what they call Skittle parties, where they put them all into one big bowl and everyone looks like a bunch of skills and they take it out and they take it. You know, teachers have to, to be able to see what's going on in the classroom, but, it's, but they have to talk to parents and they have to talk to kids. We all need to start to communicate more. And I always say that in 2016, we have more modes of communication and we communicate less with each other mm -hmm. because of these damn phones. And, and everyone has a phone that they're hiding things on. The kids can you know, talk to each other and do that. We need to really start to take a look at what we're doing. Providers need to start to talk to their patients. You know, When we talk about um, your doctor giving you your script, when's the last time your doctor physically handed you your script and it wasn't the woman at the checkout counter? When's the last time the doctor said, here, I'm giving you 30 Percocets for something? It's usually the nurse on the way out. You don't really get to have that conversation with the doctor, which is why we need to start communicating more. And in a time when we're crunched for time, you know, insurance companies are part of this too. We have to force our insurance companies to step up and start to pay for what we should be having covered. Um, you know, I won't go on my rant that there's no mental health parity in, that, in Massachusetts or in the United States. I won't go on my rant that if you get, if you suffer from substance abuse disorder, you're going to get less treatment than if you have a cardiac disease. Um, but the, what we're trying to do here encompasses everything. Um, we're trying to protect our police officers and our firefighters. You don't know the number of times when someone's coming out of their hive with the use of Narcan that these guys are getting assaulted, they're getting threatened, they're going to be sued in court. Mm -hmm. When you call 911, the expectation is someone shows up. You, you know, you're not going to fight it afterwards. And we did this Good Samaritan law that if you're with someone who's overdosing, we want you to call. We want you to get that person help. We will not help keep you held responsible. And the PD can talk about that. You know, unless you have um, amounts in the areas of distribution and trafficking, which is where the DA will come in. A lot of what we talk about on Beacon Hill is real life. And so that's what we're trying to figure out with the, with the treatment and the education. Do you know that, that the research shows if you don't start in the fourth grade, you lose them by middle school? So when parents say to me, how dare you talk to my high schoolers, I look at them and say, we're, we're late to the game. We're supposed to be talking to the fourth graders. Something as simple as, if your name's not on the bottle, you can't take this medicine. Because if you look at the headlines and you look at the newspapers, all, most of the drug busts are heroin. It's not Oxy. People are using Oxy and they're using Percocets from legal prescriptions, mm -hmm. which is why we, we took on the doctors and we tried to, to take on some of that. And when you blame the emergency room docs, only 4.7% of the prescriptions are coming from emergency room docs. So they're coming from someplace else. But the problem is that we're pointing the, the blame at everybody else. So we, the next steps for us, I think, is we really not, need to start to tackle how we get this implemented. Let's talk, let DPH do their work. Um, the governor has done some, some really good policies around that. But then the next session, if we all pass through the election cycle, <laughs> and, and the chairman and I have talked about this, <coughs> is housing, is education, is, is jobs and employment. Um, I've been into detox with people who could care less about detox, they're worried about where they're going to sleep on the night after they get released. Mm -hmm. I've been in post-detox in your district with men who can't get a job. So what good is it for them to do anything, they tell me. I've been in jail with people who have lost everything and have no place to go after. 
the ancillary stuff is the stuff we need to, to do next because if you're coming out of detox and you're in recovery and it's great and we're going to support you, <coughs> if you can't support yourself with a job and an apartment and, and an education, you're right back into that cycle that you were at. So, so the next steps for, for us is sort of letting this play out, trying to, to tweak it as we need to, and then moving on to the, to the next issues. I think, yes. I, think, I think basically as much, again, as, and, and, and the Senator is really, is really correct about this because people are looking for a fix and they want it now. We're looking at trying to build, to, to you know, fix a dam that has so many leaks in it, um, we're just finding out day by day. So you try to triage, you try to find the place where the most serious, you know, breaches in the, in, in the dam and then, and then, you know, get back and, and, and keep looking so that you can, eventually we have to rebuild the bridge. We have to build a stronger bridge. Um, we have to build an infrastructure that works. You know, years ago, um, there wasn't very much understanding of what the disease of addiction uh, involved. And we had state agencies that were developed in silos, um, again, with good intentions, but not with understanding of how we're gonna solve problems. So that there would be, you know, a Department of Mental Health, and then there would be a Department of Public Health, and there's a Department of Education, and there's a Department of Corrections. Not a lot of interaction happened traditionally in, in that structure of government. I think what we're getting to now is that we're really finding people working together on the, the courts, uh, law enforcement, um, folks in the recovery community, you know, our sheriffs who've done an incredible job um, addressing um, the addiction problems of a lot of their inmates, and they're starting to bring us information in the legislature. Um, you know, there's like partnerships being developed now that we, we just didn't have before, and it was because we didn't know. I mean, we didn't understand how the dynamics of this work. We're gonna have to keep collecting the data that we're getting now. Um, the first implementation of um, the 14-day treatment legislation that we passed in the last session uh, went into effect, I think it was October 1st. Yeah. Last so year. As of, as of October 1st this year, um, if you um, ended up in the hospital and needed treatment, needed detox, you have to, your, your insurance coverage has to include at least the first 14 days. It's just a beginning. And what we're finding is that we don't have enough steps in the ladder um, to be able to catch people Addic addiction recovery is a, is a is a continuous long problem, long solution. It's a trip. It's a you know it's a it's a journey, and you know getting out, detoxing, and what sometimes people refer to as the spin dry cycle, is crucial because that saves the lives immediately. But then what we have to try to figure out is what is it going to take to build the system that's going to give people who are suffering from this disease a long enough period of time of supports and guidance and counseling so that they can begin to stand on their own two feet. And that's not something that we have yet in an infrastructure. We're, we've put, we're putting more money into to treatment, we're putting more money into beds, we're putting more money into, um, you know, basically learning how to, 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 to put together a programs for um, uh, substance abuse counseling and, and um, you know, we're, we're, we're training people, but we don't have people deployed across the state and you know some some cities and towns are doing fairly well and others are just without any resources at all so we have to figure out a way to, to really build the infrastructure across the state so that our courts are working together our, our health health care providers are working together um, um, our legislators are working together so that we're addressing the problem and the only way we're going to be able to do that is to take um, to take very good a measure of, of the data that's coming in um, and, and, and focusing on, okay, what, need, what needs to be done next? Um, right now we're monitoring the implementation of recently passed legislation to make sure it's held to the letter of the law. Um, we're, we've, we also passed this past um, legislative session, we passed something called, in, in the budget, uh, sober homes legislation, you know, a lot of, one of the big gaps around recovery uh, treatment for a lot of people is, is what do you go next after you get out of um, your immediate treatment set center? Um, a lot of times there's not enough money to cover that. People send people to sober homes. There has been a very poor understanding of what the role can be for those, those sober homes. We finally have legislation so that now 
the courts, as of September 1st, the courts will be only referring to sober homes who have completed a training period, a, a training program, a certification program that's overseen by uh, Department of Public Health. So we're starting to bring various parts and disparate aspects of this together, but you know, it's like weaving a rug. You start with the first few um, fi fibers and it doesn't seem like you're ever gonna get there, but you just keep going and we have to do that. And, and I think that conversations like this really are, are starting to help us get, you know, the, 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 the gas and the, and, and the energy we need to, to, move, to move forward. Um, and again, I think that's, talking about this is one of the best things and having these conversations is the best thing we can do right now. That's, <clears throat> thank you, and I'm gonna to go to Jen and then to, uh, to Diane. And I think it was, what was very uh, special and important was all the vendors, for lack of a better term, we had tonight, I think some of them may not even know of each other. Mm -hmm. And if they met each other and could work That's together, you know, such as Naranon, uh, the gentleman from Naranon was telling me they're, they're, for lack of a better term, we, you would think they'd be getting a lot of business from family members that are going through this, they're not. So there are some resources there. And as you can tell, it's like a wave where we're almost I don't know if scrambling is the best word to use, but we are to, 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 to get an inventory of the resources that we have out there. And that was the way they work, part of why they work so hard on that legislation. And, uh, and Jen, if you could, as, as one of the point agencies on implementing that legislation and fighting this, what, can you tell us you know, the tools that DPH has now, uh, how are you working with them, what do we need, we as legislators need to do to give you even more tools or better tools, uh, please let us know. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think one of the most positive out outcomes of the law that was passed was that it really allows cross secretariats to speak with each other and to implement really great initiatives. We're working with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education to provide resources to schools, uh, age appropriate materials. We have, um, some of you might know that there's a sports concussion law where um, an athlete who has a sports concussion needs to be uh, reported to the department and as part of that we've included information on substance use, how to identify the signs, and really trying to be cross-jurisdictional, if you will, on how we're approaching this. Um, one of the key elements that we, you know, we're talking about education, it's not just parents, it's not just students, it's not just law enforcement, but it's also the prescribers. And so this administration has worked with uh, physicians and dentists to just to come up with some core competencies, best practices for students who are going through med school, um, how to talk to your patients, how to prescribe. Is prescribing an opiate the best course of treatment for your patient? Um, and we have heard that there are med students, uh, well, I guess now actually practicing, who didn't have that kind of education and don't really know how to approach their patients. And I think that that's a key uh, piece to this, a piece to this, to this fight. And the DA had mentioned um, pain management training. And as part of the new law, there is a component that requires pain management training. Again, is it a chronic pain issue? How do you talk to your patient? How do you explain to your patient what the effects of the medication that you're actually prescribing are? Um, that there is an addictive component. I think being able to work, again, across secretariats with our partners to tackle this from all sides uh, is really the way that we're going to be able to do this. And I think that as we work with the legislature moving forward, uh, it's been great to have them as a resource. Uh, they hear stories or anecdotes, if you will, I hate calling them stories. Um, and again, address some of the gaps that we, we, that we also hear. And I think moving forward, we've heard the same thing, housing, what happens next? I've gone through treatment, I have no place to go, where do I go? The department is working with, I'm going to mess up the acronym, it's called MASH, to certify sober houses. Uh, I believe Chairwoman Molly has said in September, um, state agencies can only refer to those that are certified. There is approximately 900 or so individuals currently that get referred to sober homes. We have a lot of work to do before September 1st. Um, probably another little plug, if you know of a sober home that wants to be certified, let us know. We're, we're out there, we're doing it. We're it's about a day or two turnaround. Um, we need to start looking at what's coming next. I've heard stories um, of individuals who have said, I'm in recovery. I don't know how to do my laundry. I don't know how to pay my rent. 
Um, and I think that that will be the next focus, not only from the legislature, but from my role within the department as well. Jen, thank you. Can I just add one thing? Please. The easiest thing that can be done next is to talk, is to have an everyday conversation. And, and I've been asked so many times, and I, I think I've been sort of desensitized to it because I talk about it like, it like it's anything, is that there's an article in every newspaper every day. You can mm -hmm. talk to your children, you can talk to your family members, you can talk to your neighbors without sort of pointing fingers of, are you an addict? Are you, you know, are you risky behavior? Is it, start to talk about what happens when you take that first pill. Because, because I'll tell you something right now, a lot of people go to heroin when they price themselves out of Oxy. Mm -hmm. And so what we're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get people to talk about this. Um, you know, we do walks for cancer, we do walks for MS, we do walks for all these things. We have all these public um, campaigns and raising all this money. I get that addicts are a really hard population to love and care about, but they're people. And they didn't wake up one day wanting to be an addict. And I think that is the biggest piece that when, when people come to my office and, you know, I put people into detox all the time. The month of September, we put 14 people into detox in 22 days. That's not the role of a senator. But we're not going to turn our back and say no. You have these conversations within your families, it gets a lot easier to talk about it in forums like this without being ashamed about it, without saying that you know someone who is a heroin addict or you know someone that is sub, um, suffering from substance use disorder. I get that back in the day, and, and I, I apologize, I'm not a graduate of Clinton High, I'm a graduate of Leominster High. We won't hold <laughs> it against you my that much. That. Um, but back in the day, we were afraid of heroin addicts. Mm -hmm. But today, they're everybody's family. And, and so when you say, what's the next step, have that conversation. I don't care if it's on text message, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or God forbid, in, in face to face, just have that conversation. Because when you end up talking to people like us, it's usually too late. You're usually in a courtroom. You're mm -hmm. usually looking for detox. You're usually being arrested. It, that, that's, a, that's a point where you shouldn't have to get to. So the one message I hope that we can send is have this conversation. I talked to my grandfather about it. He's 89 years old and can't grasp the concept. Mm -hmm. But he knows that there's a problem out there. And he's part of the society that, you know, there's a pill to fix everything, mm -hmm. every ache and pain. Everyone can talk to somebody. Yeah. You know, I was with young girls uh, in third grade um, Girl Scouts. I don't know what, what, what group that is. But tobacco, guns, and drugs. That's what they wanted to talk about. Mm. That's, the people are looking to talk, so if it can be sure. helpful. If we move to a, a, another proud product of Lemonster mm. uh, uh, from the probation <laughs> service, Diane Richard. The one thing I wanted to sort of piggyback on is, is the collaboration piece. As, as I tell our new probation officers, nobody changes a life by themselves. We need the best mental health providers. We need the best substance abuse treatment centers, we need residential, we need our law enforcement partners, we need a village to change a life. But as, unfortunately, as a probation officer, I felt very helpless looking at a family member and not having a, a resource to say, um, here, here, mom and dad, or here, here, concerned fa family member. Um, one thing I did have learned about that I think is a great resource for family members that have somebody who's addicted to heroin or, or opiates or anything, any other, um, drug or, or alcohol for that matter, is Learn to Cope. It's a parents organization that is made up of parents that have navigated through the system and had, had their own children um, go through the process, and some successfully and some not successfully, but what they are is a support group for any family that's going through this. And they, they will guide you, they will, they will put you through the court system, they will navigate you to wherever you need to be, and most, most importantly, they will, they will embrace you in, in your situation and do everything they can to help you. I'm not usually into advocating for things as a statewide service, but um, this is just really one, if, any, if, if I can give a takeaway, please parents, if, you ha if you're dealing with this, or family members or concerned neighbors, um, learn to cope. This is the way you might want to go for that resource. Thank you, Diane. District Attorney Early, uh, similar to my two colleagues beside you, you early on have been a true leader on this. Uh, you formed quite a while ago last year uh, the Ma Central Mass Opioid Task Force. Uh, could you tell us about that, who's on it, what you hope to accomplish with it, and mm -hmm. then it's been touched on very briefly, but the Good Samaritan law, because you know, it's your office that's, uh, uh, that's required to enforce uh, or, or deal with that statute. Sure. Um, I think the, uh, many people up here, including yourself, uh, members of the task force, uh, 
the goal was to bring in people from all walks of life because uh, we always know that in, in terms of fixing things so many of the pieces of puzzle there are there but if they're not brought together it doesn't do any good so we've got people in law enforcement we've got people in education we have people in recovery um, both those who were addicted are in recovery and those who offer services we have legislatures legislators we have a whole host of different people um, we have the pharmaceutical uh, college in Worcester we have UMass we have uh, so many different people coming together we have four subgroups out of them one is law enforcement another is uh, education and another one is housing and recovery uh, we have all the different groups that meet on their own coming together and then coming back collectively to the group to see what's working what forms we have uh, for example I, I mentioned the movie and we've paid for it uh, you know hide the darkness it's a uh, St. Albans Vermont and we bring this movie out to the community it's more for adults it's about 110 minutes if anyone wants it uh, uh, Liz Haddad and Jill Woolbridge from our task force are over there if anyone would like more information we bring if only by Mark, uh, not Mark well, James Walberg out to the schools, which the kids have the patience for. It's about a 25 minute movie. Um, these are some of the things that we're doing with the forum, recognizing, like it's been said, one, it's not a moral failure, it's a chronic illness. Um, two, uh, we can't arrest, arrest our way out of the problem. It's the way we used to do minimum mandatories. You, you, you know, there's been movement on those. I, I still back minimum mandatories when it comes to the traffic or and the people bring poison into the neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. But all of our ADAs have the mantra. Uh, Mike, they, they all have the mantra, show compassion, stay within the law. So we're living it, we're, we're doing it, we're working it. There isn't uh, a week that goes by we don't have an unintended death. And uh, you know, you, you used to see it, uh, well you see it in the obituary page, died unexpectedly, mm -hmm. with a 21 or 25. But sometimes it might be a suicide, but so often now, because of one of the main problems that we have is the synthesization of Fentanyl, uh, heroin's being cut with fentanyl. Fentanyl's 50 times stronger, and, and we're seeing more and more deaths because the dealers don't know how to cut it safely. Mm -hmm. And that, that uh, Mr. District Attorney, that, that leads to a, a question we haven't touched on yet, and I'm gonna start with Dr. Cheshire, but this is probably numerous people at this table uh, can answer it, and I'm sorry we lost our firefighters. We probably should have had a firefighter representative up here. They, they are truly at the tip of the spear of this. They, I saw them get called out on a, uh, on a call, but Narcan and the use of Narcan. And, and doctor, if we could start with you and the use of it in the emergency room and what you see, and, and we've heard good things about it, all the lives it's saved, but then we've, we've heard some criticism about the, the use of it too. So. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Narcan saves lives, there is no question. Um, <clears throat> it works immediate, it works well, it reverses opiates. But it's only one part of this problem. It is a quick Band-Aid fix. Um, there's a, still a lot of debate on, uh, that, that's out there that people will make the argument that, well, if you give people Narcan or access to Narcan, all you're doing is giving them an, an excuse to continue to use drugs. Um, I've heard the argument. Um, uh, there's no question that, that first responder use of Narcan has made a big impact on the mortality of the patients that do make it to the emergency departments. Um, I think that data is clear. Uh, there's no question that I think bystander use of Narcan is going to save lives. But again, that's the first step. Um, the, 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 the thing about Narcan to keep in mind is that <clears throat> it's not the cure-all, fix-all drug you think. It was mentioned that you know synthetics are showing up on the market. Mm -hmm. The dealers are cutting heroin with stronger synthetic opiates that don't necessarily show up in drug tests. Um, you know, fentanyl is the one that's making the news a lot. There's a lot more than fentanyl. Mm -hmm. There's one that's really scary. I can go on with a list, but I'll mention one called W18. Um, it's a synthetic uh, opiate, and it is, um, it's, it's close to a thousand times stronger than fentanyl. Um, we're talking very small quantities of this medication, and the drug dealers are finding out they can cut their supply with a very small amount of these synthetics to give it a kick. But as we all know, there's no quality control. Uh, everybody's mixing it. <coughs> heroin addicts or heroin users may buy a bag today and buy from the same dealer a week later, but the concentrations of these medications may be a hundred or a thousand fold stronger. 
One dose of Narcan may not save your life. You come to the emergency department, we may end up giving you more Narcan and more Narcan. Um, um, so the use of Narcan spreading, I think having the standing orders now in the pharmacies that are pretty much statewide, including our pharmacies that are available here in Clinton, anyone can walk into a pharmacy, at least the major pharmacies, not all have signed on, but the major pharmacies, and buy a Narcan rescue kit. Um, prices vary between $80 and $100, but, and you have to put up the money to buy it, but if you are in a, if you know someone who's at risk, or you are someone at risk, it's something you should consider having around, having it in your household. If you know you're living with a, a hair, uh, a, an addict or someone who's using narcotics, or even someone who's on very high doses of prescription pain medication for a very good medical reason. A lot of doctors now are prescribing Narcan rescue kits every time they write a prescription for one of the long-acting opiates or even short-acting opiates in high doses. And, and the families are learning um, how to use them. There are Good Samaritan laws that will protect you if you act in good faith and you think someone is not breathing because of a heroin or a narcotic overdose, you can administer Narcan to them without fear of doing something wrong. Um, it's a well-tolerated medica medication. It has very few uh, side effects uh, and can be tolerated by a wide uh, age range as well. So Narcan, while good, is still just a quick fix. You're putting a Band-Aid on an immediate medical problem. Um, I see uh, people come into our emergency room at Clinton, um, clearly overdosed, clearly will even admit they took heroin, they stopped breathing. The paramedic or police officer on the scene gave them that. <coughs> they come to my emergency department, now they're awake, they feel great, they want to leave. They have no interest in staying, they want to sign out against medical advice. The problem with Narcan is that it has a half-life in your body of anywhere between an hour and a half to two hours. If, you, if, you're, if your heroin supply is cut with one of the long-acting opiates, the, your Narcan may wear off when you're 20 minutes out the door and you're gonna be right back in the same uh, situation you were in, not breathing, um, uh, uh, vomiting that's going down into your lungs and will kill you. Um, so Nar Narcan has a place, but it's only one tool in this huge problem of getting people the treatment they need, but it does save lives. Mm -hmm. Thank you, doctor. And we'll, we'll touch on Narcan probably one more time before we end tonight, but um, Special Agent Desmond, you're with the DEA, a national agency. Uh, you've got offices all over the country. Um, what do you see coming down the pike? What, what else do we on a local level uh, need to be expecting, need to be getting prepared for, uh, and need to be ready for? Sure. I mean, I think what the doctor touched upon, uh, W18, I think we've had one episode of it this past year one seizure of it. Um, other than that, I think it was up in Canada that they've experienced some issues with it. Um, thank God we have not really seen it here in the United States. Um, again, we're dealing with fentanyl right now. Um, fentanyl has taken over. Um, not too long back, a lot of our drug exhibits were coming back with heroin with a little bit of fentanyl in it. Then it became fentanyl with a little bit of heroin in it. And now what we're seeing more of is fentanyl with a non-controlled substance, you know, an, uh, an adulterant like uh, beta-lactose, starch, and things like that. So that's what they're cutting it with. Um, the distributors, the organizations, including the users, don't know what they're getting. We could have, we could seize 20 kilos. Top kilo could have a little portion of fentanyl in it. The one below it could have 90% heroin in it and 10% fentanyl. So like the doctor said, it's not even a week. You can get it from your dealer that day, go back tomorrow, and you're not going to get the same thing, so you're not ready for it. There's no quality control. Um, but we're, we're on fentanyl right now. That's you know our number one priority. Can I just ask? I just, if I could, Oops, just just add one thing that um, uh, it's not um, it's not just <clears throat> the the fact that these batches are different. Um, it's it's also that 
you don't know what's in these mixes. Mm -hmm. And it could be fentanyl, today it's fentanyl, tomorrow, who knows? And they're cutting it with all kinds of, of agents. When, and, and you would think that if you were an addict, you'd go, wow, I need to be really careful about what I'm getting here. But there's a surprising number of people with addiction who will gravitate toward it. They're going, wow, I heard this dealer's got some new stuff and it's cut with this great strong stuff out of Canada and I want to try it. So there's this sense of adventure that goes along with the addictive personality with this big problem of drug addiction that will actually attract people to it, like a moth to a flame. So it sounds a little counterintuitive, but we encounter that quite a bit. Yeah, Rep. Malia. Say, if I can oh, just sorry, say also, sure. just not only that um, they're attracted to areas where they've seen certain overdose deaths, you know, that they'll go and seek that area out, the user will, knowing that they could die, but for, for them, their feeling is that they'll die if they don't take it, mm -hmm. if they don't get it. Um, we, we also see um, communities that have um, naloxone, users will go and seek their heroin and fentanyl from areas like that, knowing that the first responders in them have them yeah. naloxone yeah. in order to bring them back. Mm -hmm. yep. So we're seeing more in those kind of communities also. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, th I think just one clarification that I, that I think, and, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the things that I know historically has been true about the heroin that's been available um, recently and the heroin that was, you know, generationally maybe last generation, 10, 15 years ago, is that a lot of what, a lot of the heroin that is out there now is much more pure and much more accessible. And in the old days, the only way you used heroin was to inject it. And I think a lot of times that's, that's a, something that a lot of us don't always get. It's like, well, well uh, why is everybody starting to inject it? They're not necessarily starting to inject it. The heroin that's available is much, much purer. From what I'm told, you know, you can smoke it, you can snort it, people do sniff it um, for a long period of time and they figure, well, I'm safe because I'm not injecting it. And, but they can, can, you know, build on that addiction through, you know, that kind of use. So, I mean, we're, we're not talking about, you know, our father's heroin, no, no pun intended, but, it's really, they're, they're, there's something different out there. The other thing is that, you know, where there's money to be made, drug dealers are out there. Fentanyl can be manufactured. Um, a few years ago, we heard a lot more about um, problems with methamphetamines, and, which is a very dangerous drug to manufacture, but you can do it in your bathtub or your kitchen, and, you know, if it blows up, it blows up, you're gone, but, you know, it's, people are very addicted, the people who are addicted to methamphetamine are extremely, have another, you know, it's a very another variation on an addiction, but you know, if it can be manufactured and not just have to be relied on to, to be imported, it's a different. It changes it changes the availability part. Um, the other thing is that I think one of the other things people don't always understand about Narcan is that, in the reason we need to have the supports available for people who are in emergency rooms who are getting reversed, is because you immediately go into you, you immediately detox. You come down, crash, and a lot of people, you know, they're, the part of the, the illness is to get as high as you possibly can without killing yourself. And, you know, but when, you, when you're reversed, you get sick. It's not pleasant. And a lot of people, you know, for a lot of people, that's a motivating factor, and they will go out sometimes and get more drugs. Um, if we can hand people off to a counselor, if we can hand people off to somebody who can talk to them, can explain it, who's been through them, you know, um, the withdrawal is not going to kill them, probably. You know, alcohol is actually a much more dangerous withdrawal than, than narcotics. But if you feel awful, you're not going to want to do that. And so that's one of the reasons there's sometimes resistance on the part of people coming into the ERs um, in, in emergency departments. And I, and I think I'm correct about that. But, I'm, you know, again, it's part of, I've heard people say sometimes, well, we shouldn't use Narcan because we're just enabling people. If the person is dead, you're not going to be able to do anything for them. And if we can, you know, implement more of what we've done through the legislation, which is to take that first 24 hours after somebody comes into a, an emergency room with an overdose and spend time with them and concentrate some, some real you know, interactions with them, the chances of getting them into a detox 
and having them be successful is much, much greater. And, and, and again, I think that's, that's something that, again, having these conversations is really helping all of us to understand the nature of the disease that we're dealing with in the epidemic. Thank you, Representative. Going to the other end, uh, Marissa, you, again, just as DEA has a global view, pharma and your industry, um, <laughs> tell us from, I know you guys spent a lot of money in researching and in prevention, and, and, and what, what do you guys see coming down the pike what should we be expecting? What should states and municipalities, uh, police departments, fire, uh, fire departments, uh, emergency personnel be expecting? Um, what, what are you seeing as, as you know, the people who, in many instances, make this stuff? Well, I think an important tool in the toolbox that states can use are the PDMPs, which I think in the, pre in the legislation that was just passed, it's mandatory. The doctors have to consult with that before they um, mm -hmm. prescribe an opiate. I think that's a great way to ensure that people aren't doctor shopping, getting more prescriptions than they should. Additionally, our companies are working on abuse deterrent formulation products, which basically mean that you can't, it lessens the ability for someone to abuse them. You can't crush it. If you heat it up, it becomes inactive. And I think that those are important um, investments that our companies are making in trying to reduce prescription drug abuse, which will hopefully then lead to uh, reduction in heroin use as well. Um, I think what we've all kind of touched on here is that there needs to be a comprehensive approach. Narcan is a great thing. People need to have access to that. But additionally, people need to be working together, which I think in Massachusetts, you guys are doing incredibly well. Um, and obviously, the biopharmaceutical industry wants to be part of that conversation. Thank you. And I know we've passed our 8 o'clock hour, so I'm going to do about, we, we have enough questions here. We could go till midnight. And they're very, very good questions. Um, and thank you. But we're going to, I'm going to go to, uh, uh, Lieutenant Coyne, and uh, Narcon's been t Narcan's been touched on, and you know I can point out uh, our veterans agent Bren Bailey came in, and both Bren and I have seen uh, the effect of these things on our brothers and sisters returning from uh, from the wars. So uh, thank you for your presence, Brenny. Uh, Lieutenant Coyne, if, if you want to touch on Narcan, you can if you feel it's been dealt with. But what I want to hear, and if I, I've asked this before, and maybe it's because I have four teenage kids, what mm -hmm. should parents be looking for? Uh, I, I actually do want to just touch on Narcan. And uh, I think it is part of the changing role in the changing view that police have with addiction. Um, our officers have been carrying Narcan since last year. We've had a number of successful administrations of Narcan. Last month, in a five day period, we, the officers on our department saved two lives. And Narcan works. And there's a, there was a distributor or a vendor, whatever you would call out there, with Narcan. And like the doctor said, I think that we've seen some third party, some uh, bystander saves of people using Narcan, friends, relatives using Narcan before the police, before the fire department arrives. And I think that's great if it's life saving, but I think they also need to understand what the doctor says. Those people still need to get emergency services. They, the, Ambulance still needs to be called. The police still need to go there. I think that addicts are, are starting to understand now. Back in the day, we would go and there'd be charges if there was uh, paraphernalia or drugs still on the scene. Mm -hmm. But with the Good Samaritan overdose law in 2012, that's all changed. Back in the day, I've seen, I've gone to overdoses where their friends wouldn't call until the drugs were cleaned up, the needles were hidden. And then by then, a lot of times it was too late. We, I've been on calls of overdoses 10, 12 years ago where someone would have ice stuff down their underwear. That was their trying to revive their friend and, and calling the police was the last resort. I think one of the changes, and I think I see it now, that addicts understand and, and people, family members and other addicts, get their friend's help. Call the police. What our role is changing in that we're not going there to arrest people. We're going there to save lives. We're going there to help people. We'll worry about the drugs and everything afterwards. We're going there to save lives. And, and I think Narcan is working. It's a very short-term remedy. Uh, it's certainly not prevention, but it, it, it is life-saving in offices in our department, offices around the Commonwealth, and offices around the nation that are carrying it are saving lives. I see, if you see the numbers down the Fall River, or Gloucester, and those areas, there's a lot of lives. Quincy was one of the first departments in, in the Commonwealth to be carrying it and the number of saves that they've had is, is unbelievable. So I, I do, I know we've talked a lot about Narcan, but it is important and it shows what officers are doing to change 
how the culture has changed and our response has changed. Also, it sticks in my mind, it happened 19 years ago, I was on the job for six months, I went to a, um, an overdose death, a uh, 23-year-old individual, and we went to the death and we called the, um, the state police came out and, and did their thing, and I had to go to the family with another officer and we explained that their 23-year-old had died of an overdose. And that was kind of the end of it. That was the end of that call. Nowadays, we go to a call on a, a non-fatal or a fatal overdose, we follow up. We, the detectives do a great job. They talk to the people that are there. They talk to the family members. They talk to other people involved. They talk to the surviving victim of the overdose. And they follow up with that. They follow up with the courts, with probation. We have a detective who's doing great work. He's making phone calls to treatment facilities for people that are coming across his office that are involved in this, that have survived overdoses, in, in friends of, in friends of people who haven't survived the overdoses. He's been reaching out and helping out. And a lot of departments throughout the Commonwealth are doing a lot of thinking outside of the box. I know the chief in, in Gloucester is, is a, a nation, nationwide model. He was that just down at the White House the other day. A, a lot of uh, police chiefs across the country are trying to emulate. In, in a small town like Clinton, the resources are tough to put people full time on that, but we are doing that. We are concerned with it. We are handling it and responding to it and view it as a medical problem as well. And like the DA said, there's no tolerance for people that are distributing the substance or trafficking the substance. That's a whole different matter because that has to be stopped as well. But Narcan is just one of the ways following up. We've changed our computer codes in the system so we can better track overdoses and calls related to overdoses and drugs. Um, we're doing a lot of different things. We're, we're trying to see, emulate some of the things that are working out there. And, and our role is, is, is evolving and Narcan is just one of the things. I'm sorry, the, the no, second part of the parents, question what should, what should parents be looking for? And, and I know we see in the paper, you see people in their 20s, 30s, 40s died suddenly, we all know what that means. But as was mentioned here earlier tonight, you know, one of the focuses uh, are these you know, kids. Kids. Absolutely. And we are. And I think Alex touched on it when he talked before, hiding it from his parents. And I think uh, Senator Flanagan mentioned to uh, communicate. Parents have to communicate with their kids. They have to know who they're hanging around with. They have to notice changes in behavior. Their grades are changing. Their attitudes are changing. Their personalities are changing. And they have to address that. And unfortunately, with so many devices, my kids are younger, 8 and 11, and they have pads and Xboxes, and they're online, and they have all kinds of things. Teenagers have even more. They have their own cell phones, and they have a lot of privacy. They have a lot of things to hide. But parents just have to communicate. They have to communicate with kids as young, unfortunately, as fourth and fifth grade. Communicate what's out there and, and let them know what's going on in the news, not to scare them, just to educate them and, and to make sure that they're communicating with you back. There's changes in behavior. The, we, we have a little pamphlet. There's objects to look for in your child's room. The DA's office did a great job. They had a um, little presentation over there, pieces of aluminum foil, um, cotton tips, cotton balls. There's all kinds of things. It, if the imagination can think it up, a teenager can think it up. They're going to hide it from their parents, they're going to hide their behavior, and it's up to the parents, and, and not to preach to parents, and I'm a parent myself, and it scares me. You need to just communicate with your kids and know what they're doing and, and be involved in their lives. That's, that's the best thing I can say about that. Great Thank words, you. Brian. Um, one final uh, brief comment from uh, Senator Flanagan, and then I'm going to wrap up with uh, Chuck Ferris. One of the other hats that I wear is um, I sit on the board of directors for an organization called Women in Government, which is a national um, bipartisan organization. And I co-chair the National Task Force on Mental Health and Substance Abuse. And I can say with certainty that Massachusetts is really leading the way in how we're dealing with addiction and substance use disorder. Um, I recently got back from Orlando from a, a weekend long task force meeting. And listening to some of my colleagues in other states from across the country, they look at us like we have three heads saying, how did you get people to engage like that? They couldn't understand how Massachusetts defines substance use disorder as a health problem, not as a law enforcement problem. And they couldn't understand how we can put people like this all on one panel and start to move forward. So 
when, when we're trying to do the difficult things and we're making the tough decisions, just know that, you know, really with certainty, Massachusetts is really leading the way. And we're taking some steps that are first in the nation. We're taking on people like the insurance companies. We've, we've gone against pharma. We've gone against all kinds of organizations because the heart of the, the problem is that we want people to be healthy. We want them to, to beat this. And Thank we want them alive to, to do that. So I really want people to know that the work that's being done here is, has not gone unnoticed by people across the country and that we're really being looked at as a model on how to deal with, with this medical condition. So I just want to thank everybody. That thank you, that. Senator. Chuck, seem the best for last. You've, and I, and I say that sincerely, we're going to miss you at Spectrum. You've spent your life in fighting addiction and in, in, in helping people work recovery. I think uh, your, your, the compendium of knowledge you have is more than everybody else at this table put together. Um, where are we going? You know, I, I mean, what, how, did, how did this happen so quickly and so, on such a broad scale? And, and you know, what are your thoughts going forward, if you could help us um, with some you know, guidance? We, we've been asked that question a lot. How did this get so bad so fast? I remember we had a, uh, several of us went in and had a meeting with the governor Oh, I think it was probably back in December, several of the treatment providers, and, and he said, you know, I was running for governor four years ago, and he said, I heard a little bit about this, um, but he said, this time around, he said, um, it seemed like everywhere I went I heard about this, and he said, it went quickly very up to one of the, the top issues on his agenda when he came into office. He said, why did it get so bad so fast? And the simple answer that um, I said to him and a couple other people said to him, was that the reason it got so bad so fast, Governor, is nothing was done about it. The problem had been rising, the data was there, the figures were there, all right, but nothing was addressed. And now the snowball has been rolling down the hill and it's coming to roost on your watch. There's been a few people out there over the years, Senator Flanagan being one, Representative Malia being one, uh, previous to them, Senator Tolman being one, that were always raising the alarms about this, but there wasn't enough decisive action taken. And now we're seeing decisive action taken, and it's going to take a while to turn this around. I think it's, it, has, it also has to, a part of what's going to change this around too, is a change in everybody's mentality. Um, to not look at drug use as just a rite of passage with kids. This is more than a rite of passage. People are dying. They literally are dying. This is really a life and death situation. Joe said it himself, not a week goes by, they don't have somebody. We're losing four people a week in this state, across the state, to fatal overdoses, and the vast majority of them are young people. Um, the officer was quite correct when he said, you know, pay attention to what's going on with your kids. Um, I think Alex will tell you this, that the kids have a very good network out there amongst themselves. They know in high school when someone's going to get their wisdom teeth out. They know when someone's had an athletic injury, and they go to them and they lobby these kids and say, tell the doctor you need some more meds. Tell them you need to get some more meds, and it happens. Kids are smart. We've raised smart kids, and this is what they're doing, and they're going out there. So it's going to take a while to turn this around. I think one of the biggest elements that I've said right, um, comments I want to make, was I said early on, is that you folks are coming out here and listening. And you're, you're trying to learn. And you have to go back and talk to everybody else. Like any other disease, this has to do with early detection. And before I close again, please think about it before you vote for the legalization of marijuana. Please don't. I applaud that. This is it. 10 second comment on what should the take home for the people in this audience should be, starting with Agent Desmond. <laughs> 10 second comment, the one piece that if people walking out of here tonight, what they should take I from think them. The 10 most important thing is just to let everyone know that we are all working together. That right. it's not one sole entity, law enforcement, treatment, education, prevention. We have to do it. It's like a stool. You take one leg away from it, it falls. Doctor. Um, the medical part's easy solving the addiction problem, the recovery, uh, identifying these people, intervening is the key to tackling this problem. Diane. I would just like to indicate that there are 105 probation departments throughout the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Everyone stocked with people highly educated in this topic. Um, it's harder to get into probation than it is to, ha to get into Harvard. So mm -hmm. we have some really high quality, highly educated, dedicated people. You
You don't have to be in trouble with the law to stop into a probation department and ask for some assistance. Senator. Don't wait too long to ask for help. By the time mm -hmm. you think you're embarrassed or you, you have you know a high sense of pride, put that all aside. Um, we're here to help, and, and we've heard it all. There, there's not anything you're really going to shock us with. Liz Malia. There's a number of organizations. You heard a little bit about Learn to Cope. Get online. Find out where they are. Get in contact with them if you have questions yourself. Every community now has 12-step programs, NA, AA, and Al-Anon, free, accessible everywhere across the state. There are people in those programs who can talk to you and who can listen. And, and, and basically, that's just it. Ask for help. Um, and, and don't be afraid that we're dealing, you know, we're dealing with a real problem, but we're making some progress on it. DA Early, 10 seconds. Not only have you heard about all the different components to this, but our opioid task force. You get follow-up questions, whether it be prevention, whether it be treatment, call our people at the DA's office with regards to the opioid task force. We, we've got everything there. We work with everyone. There's no authorship. That's how we beat this. Marissa, 10 seconds. Thank you so much for having us here today. We hope that you'll use our Mile Beds campaign as a tool and a resource. And we're committed to working with the state on this important yeah, issue. Important. Alex, I give you 30 seconds. Um, just basically try to keep an open mind when it comes to drug addiction and alcoholism. Um, try not to cast judgment against those that you see suffering from it. You know, offer your help and support. And, um, you know, in all honesty, if anybody out there needs any referrals, any input, you know, I don't mind you coming up and asking me after this. It's something that I do regularly. And, uh, you know, I don't make money off it or anything. It's just kind of me giving back because that's what people gave me. Thank you. Thank you. Chuck. Um, this is a community problem. Um, it's not just law enforcement. It's not just a medical field. It's not just a legislative field. This is a community problem. We all have to chip in and do something about it. Jen. Um, talk to each other. Talk to us. And if you don't know how to do that, Stop Addiction is a website. It has great resources, how to talk to kids, how to talk to families, and where to go for help. Lieutenant Coyne. Like I said earlier, I think the police and, and all emergency responders are on the front line of this. We're available 24-7. Available Please don't hesitate to contact and, and don't be afraid to approach a police officer. We're here to serve our community and we understand this problem and we're starting to understand it more and more. Thank you. Thank you all. So there you have it. I have enough more questions up here to have another entire evening. And we, there is some, subjects that we didn't touch upon, which I, I wish we had gotten into more, is including mental health and, and, the, uh, and the treatment of mental health and, uh, and, and, and those issues and, and how we, we should be more upfront about our mental health issues in our society. And that could be a part of another forum. And as I said at the beginning, this is our first substance abuse awareness event, not the last, because as was demonstrated tonight, uh, there were a lot of resources here, a lot of incredibly passionate and dedicated people but as we realized, there are more questions, uh, many, many more questions than answers right now. For the people that helped us put this together and helping us get towards those answers from the Clinton School Department with uh, Superintendent Ngano, uh, Principal Hastings, uh, to uh, the Clinton item, uh, the item to the Clinton Police Department and your, and your great squad that's been here uh, the entire night, to the Lancaster Sterling Cable Company who's been recording this, and to all the vendors that showed up tonight. Uh, to uh, Clinton Hospital, and, and again, I mentioned Bill Bergrail who put this idea in my mind months ago. It shows what a truly great community we have. And all I did basically tonight was stand here uh, and, and allow people to exhibit what talent and, and greatness that they have. But this night didn't come together on its own. I have a great staff that works for me, uh, with me, with me at the State House, and they work very hard and they're incredibly dedicated, uh, from Meg Kilcoyne to Skip McCott uh, to to Jim Keady right there, and to the great Susan Templeton, everybody knows, and have him come in the door, Noah. And the guy who really was the tip of the spear, put this together and worked his heart and soul out uh, the last uh, few months putting this together, uh, Noah Futterman. I want to thank you all for being here tonight, and hope to see you all again. Two final points. Uh, Joe, you can get up, Joe. Uh, one, we do have a lot of other questions. If people leave this, and I say this to the people uh, that will watch this on TV, if you have other questions, feel free to email them to us. We will try to find answers for you, um, and we'll try to find help for you, uh, the treatment, 
and, and, and the other resources available. And two, I would ask all the participants to, Jan, where's a good, right in front here, if we want to do a group picture, to step out in front of the tables, we're going to do a group picture. Thank you so much for spending your time. You spent an extra 22 minutes with us tonight. I hope it was worthwhile.